Yeah, we have a live button on the screen. Yeah. Yep. So we'll let you. Uh, we'll let Jake start here since we kicked off the discussion on Twitter. Yeah, my my idea came from doing uh, oh probably fifteen hundred classrooms, maybe more, in the last year and a half. Um, doing a full design, looking what their needs were, etc. And when I looked at the numbers afterwards, we never cleared more than one AP per two and a half classrooms. Actually, the number was one to 2.65. And that was delivering four radios, um, two two fours and two five gigs, and neg 67 to every single location on campus. Actually, it was 95%. We didn't do, we did, left a little slide for bathrooms, etc. How did so you get, how did you get four radios? So the, the goal was to have dual uh, coverage in both frequencies. So obviously 2.4 was easy. In 5 gig, we wanted to have two 5 gig radios and Neg 67, basically because it allowed for it was it was a Cisco voice or a um, Vocera voice level, uh, and the the schools didn't know whether or not they were going to end up being in voice. How, so how are you going for radios? That was, Your typical access point has two radios. Right. So what I'm saying is when we measured. In a room, it would have it would have two two fours, um, two two fours, and two five gigs, and make sixty seven to every single location on campus. Hold on, actually, it was ninety five percent. We did there. Sorry, I went and cut off my other <laughs> the Google Plus Live, um, and there was a, there was a delay there. the The idea was to to make sure that at any location you could have a client. Any client could see four radios as a minimum. They usually see two 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 five gigs and and five or six two fours, and we have to turn down the two fours. But that would give you at least four radios to choose from. And with today's APs, four radios, each radio can easily handle 50 clients at a, at a minimum. So that's uh, you know 200 client capacity at any one location far exceeds any actual need. Oh, I see. So I'm seeing that, and and you know obviously that was a lot of work to get through 18 months of doing all that design. And then when I hear people talk about one AP per classroom. I don't know how they could possibly get to there without having massive co-channel interference. Not to mention two four, but also in five gig. So um, that's yeah. I think that's the that's the that's the you hit the nail on the head. There is let's say that the capacity requirements were far greater than what you um, were designing for in the schools that you were just talking about, Keith. Even if the capacity requirements were far greater, the the fact is you just can't get a ra a two four radio in each classroom. Um, regardless of antenna use, especially once you start talking about multi-story. I mean, if you want to talk about shooting with a 2566 or a patch straight down in you know the, in the center of each classroom, and maybe you could sort of you know stretch that. But in multi-story, I just, regardless of capacity requirements, I think it's impossible to get well, a two four radio in each classroom. I disagree with that. I mean, I think it's difficult to make it work, but the scale. Is really a function of the power level. So it doesn't. You're going to have overlapping channels, and you're going to have some interference between the access points, no matter what, in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. So the size of your, say, your minus 70 dB, 76 dB limit, is strictly a function of the power level. So if you knock the power level down, you can scale that. That size of that. Sure. I'm actually talking about a neg 85 limit. I I'm saying at minimum transmit power with a directional antenna, I can't get, I cannot get neg 85 or weaker away from the next AP on channel. And um, you you did mention that the scale there, and that that is a that is an important factor, right? We sort of can't talk about this without at least mentioning it depends on the size of these classrooms and the size of, size of the building, and also the loss that you're going to get in between each wall, right? I mean, those are factors that you absolutely have to consider. Um, I can only say from my experience in, in the buildings that I'm working with, so I, I have a campus. I have some buildings that are, you know, stick and sheetrock, and I have other buildings that are uh, CMU. But I can't really get, and I, there's, there's not a single one of those buildings where even with directional antenna, I can put a 2-4 radio in each room and get, and, and not have negative 5 or stronger co-channel. But uh, and, and that's with patches, and that's with down tilt in the corner, with, or you know I've also tried in the center. Um, I've tried you know you shooting can't. it down the side. The problem with with the directional antennas is as you squeeze that beam, it, you're you're increasing gain, right? So now 
sure, you, you've tightened it a little bit, but you're actually shooting it more into the neighboring rooms, whether you're going through the side or through the floors. You can't, you can't go down an even lower power level, or that's... That's, that's, at, that's at, at, at minimum power, min, minimum TX. What, what, what's the milliwatt? Your, what milliwatt are you talking about? So on a Cisco AP, what is it, 2? DVM, so... Or it might even be 0. I can... Okay. I'll have, to, I'll have to double check that. So it's set to two, 2 dBm at the minimum. You still can't get the minus. Yeah, I can't remember what, what the minimum is when you, uh, on, you, know, when you set the, the power level on the, on the controller, you know, the 0 through 7. Somebody else might, might remember that offhand. But, but the issue isn't really, you know, at neg 85, you're going to see 85 everywhere in 2.4. Uh, I try to just minimize it and basically turn a whole bunch of the 2.4 radios off. Right. I design for 5 gig. And even, even five gig, if I if I clear more than one AP per two classrooms, I'm getting five gig co-channel interference. So right. that's that's for me is the constraint. And when you say uh, higher capacity, that's I mean I'm I'm talking about I've got the capacity in the designs we're currently doing now to have 200 devices in any area. That's that's more than most K12 is going to play with. Now obviously when we get into auditoriums, we, we play a whole different game. I'm just talking about the classroom space. Right. Yeah, the lecture hall scenario, I think that could be a, another conversation maybe. That's, a, that's an interesting one as well. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I say neg 85. Obviously, you know, I'm talking about the, you know, the CCA that's going to kick off. So really, are you increasing capacity when you have that other radio? Not really. But well, I, I'm in the same boat. I kind of, you know, at 85 is generous. I'm shooting for 80 or, or better. Well, Keith, Keith brought up a good point that you can turn off some of the 2.4 gigahertz radios. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, I, I actually employ that method a lot. I, so, I wish I could do. I, I wish I could put them into sniffer mode or do something with them because I'm yeah. at the point where I, I kind of would like to maybe just buy single band APs. Yeah. Hey, I would like a dual band AP, a dual radio AP, single band. So two yeah. five gig radios. There you go. Would be a nice alternative. Yeah, you're preaching to the choir there. Um, but I think, um, at least in the 5 gigahertz range, fortunately, a lot of the devices that are coming online now all support 5 gigahertz. So that sort of solves the problem for a lot of us. And 802.11ac is sort of forcing the issue. You're going to have to go to 5 gigahertz whether you like it or not if you want to join the future of, of Wi-Fi. Yeah, the statistics have been good from the recent big conferences like uh, Airheads and Live and... Um Mobile World Congress, and I can tell you on my campus, I'm at, I think I'm in the you know, mid-70s to 80%, 5 gigahertz. I've done some public venues, uh, large stadiums, concerts, uh, football and baseball games, and we're shooting uh, above 85% now, so very good news to see that, that mobile devices in those arenas are, are clearing 85% 5 gig. Uh, yeah. Also for, for Chromebooks, it's very few of the schools that I've worked with who were cheap enough that they bought the 2.4 only Chromebooks. Most of them took the plunge and spent the extra seven dollars or whatever it costs to go with the dual band. Right. Well, the, the challenge we're seeing is is not so much that you can't uh, you can't put a, a 2.4 radio or a 5 gig radio in every classroom. It's how many of those classrooms do you have to run DFS channels and how much how many of those clients do we have DFS support for? Um, especially Uni2 extended. You know, we'll we'll have holes simply because we're using DFS channels in those areas, and they they don't not all clients participate. Yeah, it's a big one for me too. Uh, DCA in 80 code on the Cisco side of things. I'm very thankful for that because I I'm next to an airport, so I don't want to run, and I do have DFS hits, and I don't want to run those channels when I don't need to. Um, but even if that in our profile now is really going to be a help. But, if, but even if you're not talking about DFS, uh, uh, there's still a lot of non-DFS channels in 5 gigahertz. Do you guys so, use uh, 20 megahertz or 40s in your uh, school? Even, for, even 40 megahertz. There's still going to be more 40 megahertz non-DFS than, than 2.4 gigahertz. By a, by a huge factor. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the 5 gigahertz... Uh, arena, you really could do one per classroom, but you would have to shut down some of the 2.4 gigahertz radios. Hey, Jake, I just want to follow up on your comment. Uh, have you found that if you turn on DFS channels and there's a, a fairly decent randomization of, of channels, if a client actually is in a hole, what I found is there's enough 
overlapping coverage in five gig that as long as you don't have DFS next to DFS next to DFS, uh, even a non-DFS device can, can roam pretty well. Yeah, usually they'll connect. Um, the, the problem isn't so much connecting, it's getting good throughput and good data rates. Um, if you're doing one AP per classroom, most of the time you're not running really high transmit power, and a lot of those mobile devices don't support transmitting back at really high transmit, so um, RRM and, and auto, you know, uh, you know, auto channel and auto TX planning are, are ratcheting down those because they don't need to be transmitting very high, and we start running into, in 5 gigahertz, I don't have, if I get more than about one classroom away from, from that, it's right. in one-to-one -one scenarios, they're ratcheted down so far that I get really poor signal to noise, I get really poor data rates, and they'll connect, they just don't have a great experience. Well, I, just to support what you just said, I, that's why I go to a lower ratio of APs to classrooms, so I can keep the power high, so the clients continue to maintain a high SNR, high data rates, they get on and off quicker, gives us back high density. Uh, and when you put the APs just, too close I together... I that too, right? Yeah. To more shutting radios down, rather than just having them ratchet way back to nothing, ends up usually getting a, 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 better, um, a, a better client experience. Yeah. I've heard also that um, the RRM and ARM and whatnot are, are maybe going to get smarter about salt and peppering in DFS channels and making sure that they're not neighboring each other. That would be a, that'd be a big win as well. Uh, Jake was uh, at Tech Field Day last week, and when we were talking to Cisco, they brought up uh, receive SOP and the ability to kind of dumb down your receiver. Um, to me, that's a little scary because uh, I've seen when you change the CCA thresholds, all crazy stuff uh, can happen. But it's a good idea. I just I wish it was included in the RM algorithm that it would automatically find the right place to go. But right now, CCA thresholds are in the you know 85, and so if you see someone else on the same channel, you defer, and that's that's just really harmful to capacity. Right. Well, the other the other challenge around that is 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 we're talking about tweaking tweaking the RX sensitivity at the AP, it doesn't impact the client. And I guess the rationale behind that is most of our traffic is downstream toward the client, so right. if I do have contention, and as long as I maintain that signal-to-noise ratio to where that works, I think you're okay. But uh, when we first tried this, it was actually at a one-to-one -one school, one AP per classroom, um, and we were we were having major co-channel problems. Um, and we used RX SOP in 2.4 in order to solve some of that, but even you know even turning off you know three out of every four radios we were still you know uh, having channel utilization problems and we just started tweaking it and when you get it too far you know because you go from um, having poor throughput to really poor throughput and so there there comes that threshold where where it's like hey you know it was bad and we start tweaking it and it's getting better and then you hit this threshold where you know a, a large number of clients start falling off that cliff. And so it, it is. It is very dangerous um, if you get it, make very small adjustments and evaluate. And are you are you talking like adjusting one dB at a time? It even has a big jump. No, not quite quite that far. But don't go don't go and pick a really aggressive value to start with. You start mean, like with something a little. You know, yeah, it's, it, yeah. Don't don't take it all the way down to like neg sixty seven as your your threshold to start with. But yeah, if if you get too far, like if you jump a good ten dB, um, you could definitely hit a place where a lot of clients are are falling off that um, off that threshold, and suddenly you have you will have holes, and you will have uh, places where the radio just will not respond to that client. So, and I, I see this being a very useful feature, especially like in stadiums or high density auditoriums. The problem is the only time you can tune it is when there's a whole bunch of live bodies doing real work, which is the time you can't touch it. Yeah, um, that's been my difficulty is wanting to experiment with these things. It's you know the the RF environment in an empty lecture hall with um, eight radios in the in in one open space looks a lot different than when you know there's 300 uh, bodies in there with 500 devices. So it's it's. It's pretty difficult to experiment with stuff like you said when, when people are using it. So I guess uh, we're pretty much at the agreement that one AP per classroom is possible in the five gigahertz arena, but not possible in the two point four gigahertz arena. 
I, I don't even think it's possible in five gig. I haven't been able to make it work without uh, getting pretty stiff CCA uh, triggering that you you're going to have not just the CCI, the co-channel interference, but you're going to see the deferring taking over and your throughput actually drops when you have that high density with 5 gig. And, and the thing is, there's there's two big reasons why I'm not into the 1AP per classroom. First, you're wasting money. You don't need to spend it. If you're doing anything else in the school, you wouldn't put in twice as much as you need. They don't put in two cafeterias because they know that students eat in shifts. We know that not every single classroom will be running 30 iPads simultaneously next door to each other. That's just not the way the environment works. So we don't need to design for that one to one to one to one to one uh, simultaneous use. So Keith, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta disagree with you that. So I have a, a school in in my local district, and they have Technology Thursdays, and they want to use all their iPod touches, iPads, netbooks, whatever on Thursday, and every class wants to use it. And I was like, well, you know, you could do first grade on Monday, second grade on Tuesday, third grade on Wednesday, you know, fifth grade on, on Thursday, and so on, and you've got more than enough capacity for what you need, and they're, they're, they're clamoring for more because they want everyone in class on Thursday using these devices. And sometimes it is possible that they do eat in shifts, and sometimes it's possible that they all want to go to the cafeteria together. So, no, but, but architects who design schools don't design for everyone eating at the same time because that would be wasteful of their finances to build something that doesn't need to be used all the time. If you went to that same principal who asked you about, you know, Thursday, you know, technology Thursday and just said, that's going to cost you 2.7 times more than if you split it between days, I bet the principal would change his schedule. They just don't understand the extra cost that we're including. So we don't, we're not honest with our customers. We just say, oh yeah, we can. Well, yeah, at a cost. They don't need to have everyone on, on the same time. Just because they want it, part of it be able to say, sorry, I can give that to you, but. No different than when people said, we want to go in elevators and stairwells, and you go, well, we can put Wi-Fi in stairwells, but we're going to have to put in conduit, and it's going to cost two and a half times more than per square foot than anywhere else. Well, if they still want it, great. But we need to be a little more open in how we tell them what the costs are going to be. I can add to that a little bit too. Um, I think I agree with what both of you guys are saying, but I, I do have a scenarios where it's a classroom building, 75 classrooms, multi-story, and in a higher ed environment, there's no not necessarily one person to go to to say, hey, this is how much it's going to cost to have this sort of capacity that you may or may not use. And um, you know, most days every classroom is in use. You know, this is a little bit different than the the lower ed schools because it's 60 seats per room. Um, and it could be, you know, the the engineer. It could be an engineering class. It could be a business class. It, you know, it could be anything. But they are all in use at one time every day. Um, but yeah, and yeah, there is absolutely a cost to to putting one in every room. It's just sometimes it's not as easy as approaching somebody and saying, well, here here's what that cost is. You know, are you sure you want to you want to do it this way? Um, well, I I, I but, totally agree with you. When you talk about higher ed. All, all bets are off. Entirely different design. So I'm talking about K-12. Right. Well, and we'll, we'll and start with a whole other clean slate. Oh yeah. <laughs> and to your credit, Keith, you're talking about design, and I would agree. So we've uh, I, I've had a couple of districts try to put one AP per classroom in a variety of schools. Uh, we managed to pull it off in a couple, and they were generally the solid brick construction um, or solid uh, concrete walls, and it works. And I've had a school district locally try to put it in a school built in the mid '90s, and it was all drywall with, and you know, five gigahertz was a, was a mess. I mean, you're talking two and a half dB of attenuation per wall. You couldn't bleed it off fast enough. Um, so, and, and it also depends on the shape of the school. Middle schools are tend to be big squares, and elementaries tend to have wings where you know you have a long hallway with a classroom on either side. Long hallways with classrooms tend to tend to be a lot easier to separate RF versus big square buildings. Uh, so, so those are things that you got to keep in mind. Where it's like, hey, I have a big square school with its four hallways by you know by 25 classrooms. It's going to be really hard to not have that that noise. The your CCA threshold start creeping in even in five gigahertz. Well, all, all I really want to say is on the whole 180 per classroom. I don't care at all if the end result of a proper design 
is one AP per classroom. What I'm against is people who walk in from a marketing standpoint and they don't do a design. They say silly things like, uh, well, our customer won't pay for a design, so instead they'll pay for it for having twice as many APs as they need. It, it, as, a, as a marketing tool, I think it's silly. As a end result of a proper design, if that's what you end up with, great. And there's nothing wrong with saying, we have one AP per classroom and here's the reasons why. Well, then it goes back to the rules of thumb. I mean, you can't really have a rule of thumb in place of a, of a proper design, right? I mean, that's sort of what you hear people preach, and it applies here as well. What's that? Also, you we also have some other things we're fighting as well. Um, you heard that rule of thumb? You can make your wife with a stick as big as your thumb. That's uh, marry guys with small hands. <laughs> well, uh, so the the other problem is, is and it, this is kind of a comment on maybe maybe it's part of the U.S. education system. Uh, I recently had a really good talk with Tom Hollingsworth about E-rate, and services are classified very much differently than hardware. Uh, I know a lot of districts have policies about what they can spend on hardware versus what they can spend on services. So you come in, it's like, hey, you know, you need to do a design. Well, does that come out in terms of a service dollar or a hardware dollar? And they're like, oh, it's a service dollar. Oh, no, we just rather throw hardware at the problem because of the budget bucket it comes out of. So, But Avar can easily move that around and just change the pricing. It, it, you don't have to play those kind of games and say, well, they're not going to pay because it's a service. You can get the money someplace. There's more than enough margin in hardware that you don't have to go and play around and say, I'm not going to do a design because they're not going to pay. Well, they pay one way or another. You do pay one way or the other. I, I will, I will and tell I you. think it's cheaper to pay for design, even if it's just hidden in the cost of hardware, than to use this one AP per classroom mantra, spend all that money, not just for the AP, but for the, the cabling, the switch ports, the PoE that you have to do. All of that cost comes into bear, and so you're having more costs than a simple design. A couple grand would design most elementary schools easily, and you'll blow that in just one wing of doubling up APs. And what about post installation? I mean, if uh, I mean, I don't know. What have you seen, Jake? If they're not willing to pay for an upfront design, are they willing to pay for a post installation survey, a verification? It depends. Um, I'm I'm pretty lucky that most of my local customers. Uh, we we talk them into that, um, but I do have I do have some customers in some rural parts of the country where they they just say put it in and see later. And it, to to your to your point, Keith, yeah, we could hide that in the hardware, but we're not going to win it. Um, and that's kind of the the problem is that hardware is a very competitive game. Um, you know, if I go in and say I'm going to build survey and design costs into every AP, somebody's going to come along behind me who won't. And and at that point, it's like well. What's the value? I, I and you know I give away a lot of a lot of design work for for K through 12, uh, working at at lower lower costs and stuff like that to try to help make it so they can afford to do some of those things. Yeah, I, I just figure if, if you're gonna install it, you should verify it when you're done. We don't pay cable contractors to come into a school or anywhere and bring in and say we want Cat 6 cable, and then after the fact, not validate that the cable is actually Cat 6. Because we know that we're going to run into all sorts of physical errors in the future, so we pay the cable contractor, and part of the contract is you're going to come back and give us a validation report on every single port and every single patch cable that we have, and then we feel comfortable in paying you your invoice. That should be no different in the wireless world. I mean, you may want to do one before, but you must do one after. It, it's just a lot more, so the performance report you get from, from running a cable test is a lot more subjective than what you get at the end of the survey. If I hand you a survey okay. that says, pass, yes, oh, hey, you know, all these cables pass the spec, but you hand them a survey and they're like, what is this? You know, you, um, you can easily hand them a survey, either Air Magna or Ekahal has a set of requirements and say, our requirement is two APs and neg 65 on five gig in 95% of the area and you can actually meet that spec and show it on all your reports. Actually, I, I try to not give colored, pretty maps to my customers. What I give them is, here was the design spec. Did we meet it? Just like you do with a cable guy. George, you've been quiet. No, you guys are making great points. Uh, I think somebody wanted to do a slide or something. Is that Mike? Oh, uh, no. Um... Uh, Andrew had said he was going to bring some slides, but he he decided not to show. 
Oh, I see. Okay. All right. But I, I think it's been a great discussion. Um, I think the only point uh, that I might slightly disagree with is I think it is possible to do one access point at, in the five gigahertz range per classroom. Just, just if you if you're using 20, 20 megahertz channels. It's gonna depend on construction. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, like I said, I'm not against the result of ending in one AV or a classroom. It's the start using that as a starting point. Right, right. If the design requires that, then sure, go for it. Yeah, and I think um, I think Mike, you made you made a great point about the distinction between the university and K through twelve. Yeah, it's a little bit a little bit different ball game. Not to mention you have different construction, different sizes, and an entirely different load. Yep. And it would be easy in an engineering building to have every classroom fully loaded every single period. Yeah, no, we, we see that um, pretty much every day throughout the semester. Every lecture hall, every classroom building, they're all, I mean, they don't they don't build more buildings than they need. So, uh, yeah, they, they are loaded. Yeah, and then you compare that to K-12, and, you know, what's the second grader? How much time is he going to be on technology? They still right. have reading, writing, math. Uh, you know, at the, at the other things to do. And, and, and technology is a nice augmentation, but in an engineering class, they're just on all time. Yeah, it's, it's a requirement. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think if you're blocking the video streaming sites, then most of the capacity issues go away. <laughs> Take out Facebook and, yeah, that would be good. Without blocking anything on a, in higher ed. <laughs> right, right. Well... Facebook, as long as you're not talking about video. I think that's more for attention span. Yeah. Okay, I think, um, does anybody else want to have anything to add? I'm good. Yeah. Thanks for putting this together, George. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. The, tech the technology worked pretty good. Yeah, thank you for attending. Check, you know. Yeah, so um, I think um, I'll probably write something up and link to this video sort of summarize this. Sounds good. Appreciate your help. Cool. Okay. So uh, let's, we're going to wrap it up now. Nice meeting you guys. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. For